and we will see what is uh... oh. hello stopping stream yo something strange on the screen let me start again good so we will see what are challenges in connecting services what is workflows we will see some practical use cases and we will use the live demo for it so let's see what's next here when we are talking about connectivity and challenges in connecting services it actually should be easy but in fact you need to figure it out you need to parse the results there are conditional step executions that you need to implement for example then there is also the error handling and logging functionality which eventually it's not built in and uh, we we are going to see how for example uh, how for example uh, sorry someone let me stop sharing the screen again Sorry for this hiccup, it's technic technology. So uh, we are here to actually address uh, challenges in connecting services. As I was mentioning, uh, conditional step executions could be an, uh, an, an issue that you need to implement it quickly. There are no built-in error handlings and you are struggling with retries, exponential backoffs, polling, all kinds of uh, advanced techniques for working with connecting services. Now, nonetheless, we are going to see how these are actually resolved by cloud workflows. And we will see that how serverless helps us to actually scale down to zero, and which is, of course, serverless, it's a handy feature, but scaling up as well. And nonetheless, implemented authentication very easily. So with workflows, a product that's part of the Google Cloud and it sits on top of the serverless compute services and APIs as well. Let me turn on the pointer. So it sits on top of the serverless and connects APIs and external APIs as well. It's very important to understand that it connects everything which is, let's say, HTTP based. And it's very helpful for you in order to actually connect everything on the internet with it, which runs on HTTP. So what is GCP workflow? It's a step automation as a service, and it has a declarative language, either YAML or JSON. YAML is the favorite one. It's extremely useful. You already are familiar with YAML syntaxes. I consider a language that is you don't need to update libraries. You don't need to update the uh, SDKs in order to get it running as well. As it's a managed service, it has a decent uh, price. That's uh, one for 100,000 steps that you want to use it and external steps if you are uh, reaching out over the internet, it's two and a half. It has built-in conditional execution, sub workflows, it has support for external APIs and it integrates with any Google Cloud product without worrying, without worrying about authentication. Actually, that's extremely helpful because you need to actually just focus on the workflow and not handle authentication much more exactly. You set up the permission for Invoker and you have the permissions. So it provides OAuth, OEDC, secret manager integration for all kinds of services, and it's ready for enterprise level as well. It provides authenticated invocations. It can provide any authentication, for example, for a sub underlying service inside the Google Cloud platform. And also if you use together with secret manager, 
you can use an API key, which is part of the secret manager and not part of your environmental variables for external APIs as well. And of course, of offers encryption at rest and in transit as well. So let's see examples because that's why we are here to see how this is going to look like. So as I mentioned, uh, it's YAML syntax. You essentially has uh, you essentially have a function. That's sorry, a step, which is actually a step. You have a, a call argument, which is you need to add here. You want to HTTP get. You want to HTTP post. You want to connectivity service, a connector, or whatever the arguments for that uh, as well. And then you have the second step where you have the save result, you could have a condition and you could have the, for this example, running the pipeline together. Now, anatomy of a cloud workflow. A cloud workflow essentially in my examples is a YAML file. You need to deploy it. You can deploy it either via APIs or SDK tools or command line tools as well. If you use the GCloud the commands, it's extremely helpful to actually automate deploying the, call, the workflow and also executing with input parameters where you have you need to use that. None. There are situations when you need to use it. There are situations when you don't need input parameters. And you can describe, of course, an execution where you will see that, for example, it has a state succeeded. Then you have there, for example, an end time you have uh, the result, which is uh, in this situation, it was a string, but it could be a JSON object as well. And of course, uh, the, the name, which is the ID of the workflow. And uh, that's Sootscan. Now, let's go and uh, look for sample workflows. Let's see how these are actually working out uh, in the examples. So I'm going to actually switch to, to VS Code. And um, we are going to see the minimum and how to deploy it, how to run it, and how to see the execution of a workflow. A very basic uh, workflow. It's a simple file with a simple step name and a return statement, which is hello workflows. But let's jump to HTTP GET. Here you have a workflow that, for example, uses HTTP GET in order to connect an external service. You have here an action and you have a search statement that's going to look, uh, look up on Wikipedia the keyword that, that is Tesla. Now, in order to deploy it in VS Code, I've set up uh, a couple of shortcuts. First of all, I set up a GCP project uh, in order to run it in the cloud because Normally, this needs to be deployed into the GCP platform where you have, for example, the workflows in the search bar. You can have, you can locate the product like workflows. This is no workflows to display because this is just a playground for this presentation as well. And uh, secondly, on VS Code, I've developed a GCP project switcher extension, which you may try out. You can install it. It adds you to the status bar, the project, and when you click it, you can quickly switch the project and to validate uh, all this. As you see here in the status bar, the project is already set up. Now, next, if you are familiar with VS Code, you can create tasks. And in order to deploy it, I created a couple of shortcuts. You see here in the quick run panel. And let me show you the definitions for those. So for example, to deploy a workflow, we need to execute gcloud beta. Beta is a keyword that's uh, optional. gcloud beta workflows deploy. I've used some parameters in order to get it to uh, write the file name. So if I want to deploy, for example, uh, the, below, the example that we have uh, discussed with running the RAN, I can click deploy. The command that gets, gets executed is gcloud workflow deploy the name HTTP get, which is part of the file name and a full path to the, to the path. And this is deployed. Now, if I go back to the 
interface, I'm going to see that uh, this workflow is there in the list. Yeah, come on, internet, it's there. So essentially, we deployed Google Cloud workflows. Now, in order to execute the workflow, again, I've set up uh, in the tasks <coughs> a command that gcloud workflow executes. I'm getting the name from the file base name. And also I have for describe last. Describe last is actually describing the last execution in the development environment that you have actually used for that. Now, if I go back to, to this uh, example of mine, then uh, I'm going to actually execute this. And you will see that uh, it returns a command that describes that single execution, but I also have describe last. When I describe last, you will see here that the results are there. For example, Tesla, those kind of keywords are in Wikipedia. If I want to change, for example, uh, uh, Lithuania, Lithuania something, then I can actually run the workflow, which actually does all the steps for you. There are uh, deploying, execution, and describing uh, for as well that. You see, for example, Lithuanian keywords, some Lithuanian keywords uh, on Wikipedia for that. So this is how you actually build out a basic example of a GET statement. Next, uh, let's see a much more deeper example. Let's see a post uh, example, a HTTP post example. And we are going to use, again, an external API, and that's Bitly service. Bitly service needs a secret, needs an API key. And for that API key, we actually used Cloud Workflows to build it as a pipeline. As you see here, I will expand additional steps in the beginning. So there is a first step, <clears throat> which is is this is setting a variable of secret called Bitly API key. That's the name of the variable I've used in the secret manager. Next, there is a HTTP GET statement to the API endpoint. And here you can actually copy paste the API key, the API endpoints that you want to address and connect services with some parameters like getting the secret and getting the latest uh, version of the secret. And once we get the secret, we need to decode it because secrets are returned in a base64 syntax. And once we decode the, the secret, we put it in a decoded secret variable. And then, for example, we are able to use later in the workflow process. Why this is good, and while I'm uh, talking about this, let's deploy this uh, workflow and see how it works. Why this is good? This is good because secrets are not compiled part of the code. They are not part of the environmental variables as well. They are actually part of the execution. And uh, when you deploy a workflow, you can forget about the secrets, even if some somebody or an admin or a different person changes the API key for for the secret. Your workflow do, doesn't need to be redeployed because it actually relates on the fly for it. As you have seen, this uh, workflow executed. This is our short URL, which is uh, with EMP. I can actually change here and use different domain like Bitly. And I can run again the workflow to actually see how easy it is to actually work as a developer, DevOps engineer, whatever your, your role is, to actually get it uh, running with, uh, with workflow and executing. And of course, you see here that uh, the new URL is, barred, is back. You see that the answer is a JSON. You can actually implement this as in a pipeline, in a step engine, or in an API as well. In the interface, you will see that uh, the, the workflows are there. If, you, if I want to show you that uh, here inside the editor, we have a code section where we can add the, the code on the fly on the interface. And in the right, you have a chart that actually layouts the steps that you actually have for your workflow. It's an intuitive uh, UI element for you. Now, let's continue with the presentation. 
and let's see what uh, else we have uh, here. How you could use this inside your organization? You could have IT management automation built out with cloud workflows. You can combine automation with a scheduler, which means that, uh, for example, you could have a 9 a.m. trigger and uh, that actually starts a VM or starts a computer. It could wait, for example, 60 seconds. And then, for example, if it didn't happen, you could log the event, notify the team. It could be a Slack notification placed inside the group as well. Or uh, you could fantastically overcomplicate some actions that you want to, for example, start a VM to do a single action, then shut down and uh, actually leverage the clouds uh, at the most of it. So not uh, you can run a full machine just for a task. Orchestration works across uh, a couple of products, which is in here, but it orchestrates every product on the internet, which is HTTP based, and it orchestrates mostly GCP products very easy with connectors. You could, for example, have email e-commerce, invoice generation or email generation with cloud workflows. You could have a receive order event fired, emitted by your application that actually launches uh, the workflow process. A workflow creates and launches the create an invoice process step, which could, for example, further should be done by an app engine application or a VM, whatever, a serverless application. Then the next one, could generate a PDF and send the PDF via email. These kind of workflows, for example, could be nowadays reused in a workflow engine and your team and the development team actually just pings the workflow that, hey, you should start doing your job. And then the workflow engine actually does all the pipeline and so on. There could be cons uh, conditionals, uh, trees, setups, uh, with uh, different parameters, if statements, and it actually handles errors and it does automatic retries for that. You can even have a process uh, array elements like work with a list of customers, list of items that you want to actually run. And uh, all these examples actually help you to build out a full, uh, full example. Now, um, let me show you some other examples, which are, let's say, the complex part of it. So as I show you, this is the post, which I already live demoed for you. This is also the, the HTTP cat, which uh, I have live demoed for you before, but there are sub workflows. Sub workflows are actually very helpful in order to reuse a sub workflow in your application development. You could, for example, define a sub workflow which name message with include parameters and a definition. And then when you want to call a sub workflow in the called statement, you just actually use the name of the workflow, which is part of this definition and also the arguments as an input parameters. This works out great in order to actually build out a sub workflow or recipes you found on the internet because the manual of the workflow already has examples. So if you look up the connectors, for example, on different services, you will see copy paste examples for, uh, for running sub workflows and it's very helpful. Then there is retries, which is built in. Remember, we started our session with connectivity and challenges in connectivity. Well, it's extremely easy to actually add in a predicate and it has a default predicate where you can add additional parameters like what is the max retry of a service, what's the initial delay, what's the multiplier, the exponential backup of backup uh, backup of the API and this is works out of the box. You just add the parameters there and you have uh, also the try statement uh, and exception in case, the, in case the API returns some failure. So essentially among the benefits for developers, it's the DevOps style, orchestrate and automate the cloud. And let's see complex examples because that's actually the true value of uh, orchestrating the cloud. So 
I have a couple of uh, articles written about the extremal, ex extreme use case, for example, cloud workflows. You will find them on Medium as well. And here, let's talk about uh, some of those uh, examples, like Firestore backups. As you may notice, Firestore offers some kind of backups, but they are, let's say, not fully automated. And it's very easy for you to actually set up backups for Firestore. Firestore is having, let's say, first of all, you may ask, often I get this question, like, how do you trigger a backup? Firestore API has an endpoint to trigger the backup. It actually, it's a very simple API and it needs a path where to store the backup. That's a cloud storage path. So what essentially you need to you to prepare is to create a bucket where you will store the backup and then launch the Firebase API. How do you automate this? You can use Cloud Workflows to automate this. Cloud Workflows defines the, actually the steps that uh, you trigger for automating this uh, API. And you, for example, launch it with a scheduler, cloud scheduler. You can launch it every hour or daily or weekly. It's, it's, that's depending on the, on the business application logic and the bucket that you are using. We, for example, use uh, daily and weekly backups as well. What's interesting in here is that this code base, it's actually a 20 line example, and you need to actually copy paste the YAML file, which is extremely short. And that's it. You don't need to maintain any API, any library, any SDK. You just actually put it in place and that's it there. You can even forget it about it. In six months, you will go. You won't get an email that uh, a new version is being deprecated, and so on. So let me show you. Hopefully, this is here in my Firestore backups. I want to quickly show you how the structure of the code looks like. Yeah, it's actually shorter than I expected. It's only sixteen lines of code. There are actually two steps in here, which is the initialize, where I have the Google project that this workflow runs as a sys variable. The Firebase database ID default, that's an industry setup. That's how you need to use it. There are no other options there. You need to use default. And the backup bucket where I'm going to actually execute uh, the backups. And you will see here, this is the HTTP POST call because this is an API call. And this is the full address of the API that's going to be called. Now about authentication. Authentication, I've set only the type of auto authentication, which is OAU2. And of course, the parameter where I'm actually going to have the Google Cloud Storage. Now, you may wonder how this workflow does the authentication. Well, that's, in that's interesting because in the, in the workflow concept, the invoker, so who invokes the cloud workflow is actually defines the permission for the additional tasks. What you need to do, for example, when you set up in Cloud Scheduler as the invoker of this workflow, you set up a service account uh, that has the right permission in order to access, for example, Cloud Firestore and have right access to cloud storage and have invoker access for cloud workflows. And you define these roles or even uh, additional permissions for that service key account. So you don't need to have a full open editor or project admin permission in order to run this. Next, another example is to actually use cloud workflows to load cloud storage files into BigQuery, which means that uh, you trigger a cloud workflow, which looks on the cloud storage. For example, it searches, it lists some files in a bucket, in a folder. There are ways to actually filter these kind of operations. And then the list for each, the data is actually placed into BigQuery. This could be, for example, uh, described as a, as a 
syntax, for example, if you want to deduct a table name or a part of a file name into a table syntax or a specific uh, partition key, columns, whatever, you are able to actually get out from the string uh, an element and actually use that as a part of a further pipeline. The further pipeline is actually running the BigQuery import for this operation. You will find this article on Medium as well. It's a longer process to actually demo it uh, here inside this session. And my favorite uh, is running shell commands on Compute Engine VMs. And this is actually opens all the way what you could actually build out for with, with Cloud Workflows. What people often ask me that why to have a VM? Okay, we could have a VM just for this task. Remember that some of the tasks could be complicated that you could not put in a in a function. You may need the disk. You may run a let's say media conversion where you would have a, a need for GPU. You need the disk storage, and this kind of operation could be run only once or an occasion or on a different set of machines. You could, for example, automate and orchestrate these kind of DevOps jobs and even work, let's say, extremely in an authentication, in an identity-aware proxy manner with your shared environment. So what this article covers, it covers the serverless way to actually secure connect to a VM and to execute a command. So we will have cloud workflows as a serverless environment that's there, and it will be invoked to actually do some action in the cloud. Next, we, cloud workflows calls cloud build in order to run some shared commands. Cloud build is an engine to actually build containers, but it's also an exec executor of the shared commands. But the shared commands are actually the ones that are inside the cloud, not on your VM. So cloud workflows, it triggers cloud build to actually do the rest of the pipeline. And cloud build can use ion identity over proxy, which, which is AIP tunnel, to actually connect to the compute engine. This is a setup on the firewall. And on the compute engine, it executes the share command of your of your choice. In a, let's say that was in a nutshell, in a much more uh, expanded view, you have an execution of the card workflow. You have an authorized phase. The authorize is actually using a service account and the role and permissions to run all this kind of pipeline and also has access to cloud identity over proxy. The cloud identity aware proxy will create the tunnel to access and run compute engine and the share command of it. And of course, you could have a pipeline that, for example, you start the VM and you stop the VM once the step is done. So it's extremely helpful to actually done to do interesting stuff with it and to run all sorts of automation, like uh, even uh, running cron jobs, but cron jobs that not are part of the VM, that are part of the cloud itself, in order to do much more broader tasks for it. I've seen people already on the internet running really interesting uh, stuff, like only starting a VM and stopping a VM and running an arbitrary command there, which let's say it has a long execution time, or it needs a GPU, or it needs a, a special section of the network because that's interesting as well if you need vpc as well that's a use case if you want to use it and essentially it's automated you don't need an engineer to start it stop it you just set up the workflow for it now conclusions so benefits benefits there are lots of benefits of a workflow engine it actually it has the reliable part of it it has all the standards and all the policies that you need to run it in an, an, an in an enterprise business application way. It's audited 
uh, you have the opportunity to actually run uh, based on uh, invocations and authentications permissions that you set up only for that task. It has a low latency self execution, which means that it's, it doesn't have a cold start. It's not a cloud function. It's not a, something that needs to be boot up. It's not a container that you need to be boot up. It has built-in error handling out of the box in integration with a lot of try and catch statements with retry policies and all kind of backups that usually struggle when you want to use inside your, let's say, everyday programming language. The library may support it or you are engineering and always develop around for it. It has built-in parsing variable for JSON. That's extremely helpful. You have only seen my examples that I address some of the keys in the in the parsing uh, setup, but all the parsing in the background is working based on a JSON uh, expression. It has uh, all kind of uh, rich runtime. It, it, I, may, I may not call it like a language because it's not a language, but it can iterate through array. You can embed steps, reuse sub workflows. You can work with uh, base64 encoded strings and all kind of uh, things that actually came up with uh, pipelining and conditionally running steps uh, in the in the cloud. It integrates out of the box with Secret Manager, also with cloud logging. You could have a step to actually log a statement in the cloud log. Uh, this is actually an interesting use case because often people find that they don't want to log every item inside the VM. They only want to connect to collect multiple items from different services and to log it together. And this together is actually a good use case for cloud workflows because it could have, for example, five steps. Uh, obtain log information from piece one, piece two, and so on. And once it have all the log information, you write the log to actually to cloud logging. And this way you will have one concentrated log uh, input where you could have a JSON with uh, all the attributes that you have collected from your subsystems. And from this, you could build out dashboards. You can build out automation like uh, capacity planning, or a warning operational team, and also have uh, trending campaigns. The, there are lots of ways, like for example, uh, I've seen people using this kind of uh, workflow steps in pipeline, for example, uh, figuring out if there is a huge email campaign is going down and plot it in a dashboard uh, numbers for that. Now, and you may ask, I frequently get the question that uh, you may need a database when you develop with cloud workflows because you could have uh, three, four executions that need to write into a database and you want to actually write and read out data from there. And what you have, what options you have there to use at the database because cloud workflows being a serverless way, we need a serverless database, not as a full-blown SQL, MySQL uh, database or Spore Postgres database. Then there is Firestore. Firestore is actually a good candidate for document storage, and it's extremely helpful for you that it's accessible via REST service, via APIs. And what's accessible in by API, you can use in Cloud Workflows. SQL is not accessible by uh, API, but the but the Firestore is accessible by API as well. Um, with SQL, you need to go share command and it's a bit longer, but uh, you could automate that as well as uh, from the cloud workflow section. So uh, if you have questions, please post in the chat. I will uh, answer soon as I have only a couple of slides left and uh, I want to actually answer your questions as well for this uh, for this session as well. 
Second, to actually continue on the benefits, this service is extremely developer friendly. It's easy to build and operate. You have seen in the live demo that in a couple of minutes, you actually are able to put together, run a workflow, and you will find a lot of recipes, sub workflows that you can copy paste on the internet. You just change the parameters of it and you can actually build out pipelines for your operational uh, tasks. It scales out. I didn't demo this, but uh, actually you can actually run the workflow on a very large scale. Like it could be thousands of instances if you want for it. That I'm seeing much more in an operational way, like connecting to multiple machines to gather metrics to actually run uh, this kind of operation or to actually process something, send out something, generate something, these kind of uh, operations that uh, I'm seeing it. Next, uh, you will you have already seen that it handles errors. It has a default retry for IC for timeouts. And as you have seen, it has out-of-the-box support for cloud APIs. I can use the URL of a section and uh, automatically that pipeline is connected to the, to the workflow as well. It's language agnostic, it's YAML, so it's extremely helpful to actually connect certain services. Nonetheless, it's auditable. Why I keep mentioning auditable? Because I keep uh, getting all kind of uh, industry policies and environments where people need a workflow executor, need a step engine, which has a full automation and it has a lots of audit logs in order to search back or provide exports reports for managers or answer when did you touch that when did that happen what is the current metric who had access to that uh, why do you need access to so broad, broad permissions in a standard way but in a workflow that could be only limited for a certain task and uh, that's why auditable is a concept that it's interesting and you need to have it uh, in vision. The possibilities are endless as it connects external services, it connects the cloud, it orchestrates everything. So we have only covered, let's say, much more the developer part where you can automate the cloud. It, it could replace the shell script, uh, orchestrate DevOps workflows, but nonetheless, in the marketing section, you could have even driven marketing, workflow execution. You could relay conversions to customer profiles, for example. You could have workflow-based emails, discounts, promotions. This is something really interesting. And we are actually working on these kind of features that, for example, you could have a workflow that if someone did open an email in three hours, send an email about uh, buying that product or if someone placed in the cart in the shopping cart a product that they didn't uh, continue then they didn't purchase you could remind them in in a day or in a couple of hours that uh, hey you have something in your cart and remind it that could be part of a workflow in a serverless way next in the retail section you have uh, you could have order management you could have a process uh, environment for it you get event inventory chain operations uh, data gathering and processing i mentioned this developer wise with obtaining log information for multiple services but in retail you could actually obtain information from different sub applications, subparts, subplatforms of your system, and the workflow actually combines them together. You could later use that for synchronizing systems. In industry and IoT, which is the last session, uh, which I'm going to mention it, is that you can generate state machines. You could actually generate the YAML syntax that uh, is used on the workflow. You could build out the UI with drag and drop UI. And in the background, that's actually turned into a YAML syntax and it's a generated state machine for your logic. You could verify equipment lifecycle. You could, uh, for example, set up that in six months, uh, do some actions for that. And uh, what is the life cycle of a workflow process defined? 
and digitalization of internal policies. Uh, you could have automatic uh, response to some services. You can uh, further enrich some kind of documents and data by using only workflow as an intermediary step to enrich with a different service, like sentiment analysis. You have an input comes as a big text and the workflow actually goes to an API, like a sentiment analysis API. And when the response is coming back, the workflow passes next to your uh, next uh, service to actually answer the, the business logic that you have implemented. So there are thousands of ways and endless possibilities by using cloud workflows to connect the internet and to operate this kind of uh, API and REST services. So uh, let's see if you have any questions. So make sure that you post it in the chat um, or you can find me on Twitter as well as Martin Kodok or LinkedIn. These slides are uploaded to SlideShare. So you will have it uh, there. You can uh, check it out, a couple of examples. Don't forget about the GCP project switcher extension, which I've shown to VS Code. And uh, a couple of examples which I live demoed here and explained are part of my Medium wall. So you have it uh, also as an article and as, as a tutorial as well. You could create out your own workflows as well. So thank you for inviting me for this conference. And hopefully we will hear you next year with a different uh, topic as well. It's awesome to actually be here and to talk about you every year with the new new concepts about cloud and how DevOps getting more and more easier. You may know DevOps is a thing now. It entered in its second, do second uh, dozen of years. So you will have it uh, like we have it more than 12 years now. We are talking about DevOps. So it's extremely helpful um, topic. So I'm seeing no questions popping up. May, there may be delays, but I will answer them uh, in the chat. Uh, so feel free to actually ping me or post your questions. If there is a lag in the session, I will answer it uh, in writing into the session. Thank you and have a nice day.